This is Talkish. I am Hala Kasser Chang. The Hala Kasser Chang Show is always available online at hallikasserchang.com. Let's get to it. Today on episode 318 of the Hallie Caster Jane Show, I bring you a conversation with the author of a truly revelatory new book, The Flying Tigers, The Untold Stories of the American Pilots Who Waged a War Against Japan, Sam Kleiner. In this era in which heroes are few and far between, the story of the Flying Tigers offers us a rare glimpse into the heroes who were the men and women who put country over party, chose adventure over the status quo, a book that might be called a primer on what it takes to be the best that one can be. I'll talk more about heroes and heroines following my interview with Sam Kleiner. So as always, stick around for my commentary at the end of the show. We've got a lot to get to, so let's... Here's a story I just had to share with you. It begins in the spring of 2015, when a Yale grad student, his name Sam Kleiner, discovered a trove of letters in a basement at the university. The handwriting on the crinkled pages had faded over the decades, but the letters told the incredible story of a nurse and pilot falling in love during World War II. Now, there were a lot of nurses and pilots who fell in love back in the day. This story was special. This pilot and this nurse were members of the famed Flying Tigers, the ragtag band of American pilots and a support crew that included the nurse, who were sent to China on a covert mission before Pearl Harbor by President Franklin Roosevelt, and then sprung into action in December 1941, their daring feat making headlines back home. The image of their shark-faced P-40s becoming legendary. So moved by the letters he'd discovered, Sam struck out on a personal mission, traveling in the country to meet out the true story of the Flying Tigers, the one not captured in the John Wayne film way back when. What a journey it was. He tracked down families of the survivors and was invited to attend the Flying Tigers reunions. And there's more. Moved by his son's dedication to preserving this important chapter in history, Sam's father joined him on the adventure. Through his travels, his discoveries, through never-before-seen letters, diaries, combat records, and photographs, Kleiner pieced together the true story of the Flying Tigers, the story now told in a wonderful book, The Flying Tigers, the untold story of the American pilots who waged a secret war against Japan. Let's talk with Sam Kleiner. Okay, Sam, I have to tell you what. (laughs) Jesus, what a story. This really is... This is like, you know, one of those romantic and fabulous and it's war and it's horror and it's communism and it's, oh my God, it's everything. It's just a really delightful read. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's so much fun. And I wanted to begin, but with you first though, because I think it's extraordinary. You you were, you mentioned, in, I mentioned in the intro that uh, you were a Yale graduate student when you discovered a trove of letters in the Yale library's basement. Did you know about the Flying Tigers and were you looking for them or, 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 or what? Were you just uh, stumble upon this whole story? What's the story there? Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for making the time. Um, my, my grandfather was actually a navigator on a B-25 in the Pacific. So I always kind of grew up with these stories about the war um, from him and was a kid out in Tucson, Arizona, would go out to the Team Air and Space Museum with him and get to see some of the planes. So just a really fantastic um, personal uh, connection to the war that I always felt. And then um, as I was in graduate school, got interested in this uh, really interesting period right before Pearl Harbor and was doing research on that, you know, Roosevelt trying to balance isolationism with confronting the, the Axis powers um, and, and stumbled across the story of the Flying Tigers. And everything I could find was kind of very um, academic, and I, I was really interested in who were these actual Flying Tigers. And when I was um, at, at Yale in graduate school, I um, found a collection of love letters between a nurse and a pilot and the Flying Tigers buried in the basement of the Divinity School, way out um, uh, on the other side of campus. And um, I just said, you know, this is a really incredible story, and the human side of it needs to be told. You know, these, the story of these young men and women um, who gave up everything to go on this incredible adventure to try and defend China. And they were really part of this covert action that was being set up by the Roosevelt administration. So that um, 
it was kind of the genesis for me. And then from there, I spent the, the past couple of years traveling across the country, finding troves of different uh, collections of diaries and letters and combat reports and photographs and working with the families of the Flying Tigers um, to capture the real story and would go to the reunions that the association had been having since the 1950s. There's now, um, today, only one surviving Flying Tiger left. His name's Frank Lozanski, and he was a crew chief. And when I met him in 2015, I promised him that I was going to tell the real story of the Flying Tigers. And just last month, I was able to go down to uh, Georgia to see him, or at least outside of Columbus, and give him the final copy of the book and to let him know that I'd, I'd kept that promise. It's been remarkable for me to be able to, to tell the story. <laughs> I imagine that it has an, uh, uh, it, it's a life-altering experience. I'm sure that... The- Absolutely. So the, the letters are being a nurse named Emma Foster um, and a pilot named John P. Um, you know, just a remarkable young woman who had um, graduated from Penn State and then done a nursing degree at Yale and actually had studied abroad in China um, in the 1930s, which was so extraordinary at the time for, for a woman to think about studying abroad. And, and according to her oral history, she was the first woman that Penn State left in the study abroad program because she's, you know, if the men can be became a nurse. And the letters um, chronicle this, this extraordinary romance between them in the midst of the most extraordinary circumstances of the very beginning of World War II. So the letters are, are basically the, the correspondence of their relationship as they um, are separated in the early days of World War II. So they're training over at this base in Burma. They're together, and then they're separated. And he um, is, is out on the front lines fighting against the Japanese in Berlin, China. And these letters would be brought back and forth by plane. And the letters, you know, talk about, you know, how much, you know, he's talking about the actual combat he's participating in, and he's talking about, you know, shooting at Japanese troops and shooting at Japanese planes and, you know, kind of the mixed emotion experience, and also chronicle, you know, this incredible, uh, you know, he's one of the first Americans to participate in combat against the Japanese, and her letters, you know, talk about her life um, as, as a nurse in, in Kunming, and uh, they actually, um, when they got reunited in March of, uh, of uh, uh, um, 1942 and got married, um, and so there's there's a lot there, and um, I won't I won't give away the ending, right. but you know their story is obviously one of the uh, one of the harrowing parts of the book. Okay, so I have an audience of people, and I don't know that everybody knows. I knew the story, uh, uh, but uh, not everybody does. I want you to explain to my listeners who the first American volunteer group of the Chinese Air Force and uh, nicknamed the Flying Tigers. What who are they? What was the story? Yada, yada, yada. Have, have a ball. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with the famous image of the shark face P-40 from World War II, or they might have seen the, um, uh, the movie um, the, Flying Ti- uh, the Flying Tigers, the famous John Wayne movie. Um, and we, um, uh, um, you know, kind of take that stuff for granted, but we don't really know the backstory. And the backstory that I wanted to tell is about how Americans were secretly being sent over to China in the early days, um, actually before Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese and the Chinese were already battling, and part of as part of Roosevelt's idea that we should be the arsenal of democracy, sent over a hundred P-40 planes and a hundred um, pilots to go to fly them, who actually left the U.S. military and went over. Um, so it's really a, about a covert action. And you know, first of all, say the word Burma, and and I go to town. I want to go. <laughs> I was a war correspondent in my younger years. I mean that. Just it's so romantic. All of this has such a a, um, a feeling to it. You know, it, it, a great World Two films for sure. It's something very different than we see in the world today. That's for sure. All of this was led. This volunteer group was led by this ex army uh, pilot Claire Genault. Genault, right? You told me Genault. Uh, talk about him. G- yeah, give of us course. an because this this guy's oh my god, fascinating. Um, yeah. So Claire Genault is a is a kind of stunt pilot from the backwoods of Louisiana who. Um, is you know just has an extraordinary life story where he kind of up in in kind of a, a hard position around 1937 in his career in the army and he need, decides he needs to basically start over so he goes to China and becomes an advisor to Madame Chiang Kai-shek in 1937 so we're still talking four years before Pearl Harbor and as China and Japan start back into uh, conflict he becomes a very important advisor to her and he and I was given his diary and his letters that hadn't been seen before and chronicle this experience um, so it's 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 a really remarkable uh, story of the you know of a man who basically chooses a life of adventure and you know kind of risking everything over kind of moving back to Louisiana. And and there, his story. He had, how many kids did he have? He had I think it, it was it's eight children. He had um, um, 
two of whom by his, his second wife behind kind of a, a huge family, um, you know, for this adventure because he writes in a letter to his brother that he will make history and he feels like this is going to be his, his one shot. Um, so there's a lot of really fascinating stuff in there, um, you know, in, in terms of just a person risking everything. And that's what most of these flying tigers did was, you know, a few of them, China before, and, you know, these were guys, you know, really children of the Great Depression who um, felt like they needed to, um, you know, see something beyond what they'd grown up with. So you have guys like Bill Reed, who's one of the pilots in Iowa, who, who joins the unit. And he writes as he, in his diaries, he gets on the ship to go over. This is the first time he's been on a body of water bigger than a lake back home. So for so many of these guys, this was, you know, the first time they would see um, more of the world. I'm, I'm fascinated also by uh, his whole Army career was rift with how he even got into flying these planes. I mean, that's a story, too. I mean, I want people to understand this is really drama and and fascinating um this guy is is on so many levels uh what a hero right uh very different than the kind of people we um we meet today i think um in your research on Chiang Kai-shek and and on on Sun Mei Ling and or Sun Mei Ling um Madam Chiang Kai-shek how much fun did you have researching them and what did you discover about him first her second and the relationship that um Frank had with them or that Clara had with them um, he is, um, he's, uh, just a fascinating character and they, they refer to him as the old man. Um, so he is really, um, you know, kind of towers over the rest of them and is kind of a legendary figure amongst them. But he had a, um, a, a very close relationship with Madame Chang. Um, he referred to her as his princess in his diary and that kind of became the basis of their, um, relationship where he very much revered her. Um, and she had a number of different outside advisors. You know, there were Soviet and German and Italian advisors and other Americans. But she became very close with Claire Chenault. Um, and so he definitely had a major impact on the development of the Chinese Air Force as they were um, kind of moving along. And that, that was his job, right, to really get the Air Force going for them. I mean, that was, that's what they were looking into. Yeah. Right. Um, what was the most fascinating thing you learned about her or him that you, maybe that you didn't know, or was there anything? Well, you know, I think the book kind of goes to this idea that, you know, you know, one person really can shape history, and you think about Chenault's role in kind of the transformation of these different, uh, of this whole story, and I think, you know, re- you know listeners can, you know, you can you have to soak into the book to really get the full picture, but you can kind of, you know, you quickly come to understand how important this, this small group was in shaping history, because right after Pearl Harbor, you have this devastating attack, um, not only on, on Pearl Harbor, but uh, American and Port the Pacific in a real sense that we were going to lose this war, that America might be invaded. And then you have these incredible headlines about the Flying Tigers, who are this you know secret band of pilots on the far taking on the Japanese, and that becomes a you know a really important story in the early days of the war. Um, so there's definitely you know a, a real sense in here of how um, a small group of individuals can shape history. And along the way, I just found so many incredibly powerful stories like the story of Emma Foster and John P. Deck, um, who, you know, who became married in this unit. Um, so you, you kind of get a real appreciation of, you know, history is about, you know, it's far in the past, but, you know, with, with enough uh, research, you can really bring the story alive. And so, I, you know, I think, you know, with the 4th of July coming up, you know, we, we think it's a great, uh, great story that, you know, is kind of uniquely American. Absolutely. We, we have to talk uh, air combat, too, because uh, World War One. Uh, until the late 1930s was one thing, and then Claire comes along. He's got a whole different fighting doctrine. A revolutionary. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so Chenault has a very different view of how combat should be done. So he, um, you know, ha- he emphasizes the role of the fighter, not as someone who's going to kind of do dogfighting, but as, uh, uh, he talks to his pilots about diving into the enemy planes, and they do that and do it very successfully. So there's definitely a very compelling uh, record they have. Um, and that, you know, he quickly kind of becomes one of the key aviation theorists because of his early success in the war. Um, and, you know, just the incredible evolution of airplane technology between World War One and World War Two really necessitated different kinds of tactics. So there's there's a lot there to that we can learn from. Well, I was fascinated reading some of the, uh, in, in the beginning of the first air fight uh, in that Chinese province, whatever it was, and the, 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 what he was saying, what you could do with wings going up against uh, another plane. I mean, it's harrowing, you know, it's fascinating, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 
Go ahead. Oh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I, I was able to get the original combat reports that no one had ever seen before that, that really allow you to go into the cockpit and experience the combat along with these, these young pilots. Um, and so I think, you know, as it, when, when we think of World War II today, we don't really think of China. We might think of D-Day or think of, you know, the, the, uh, the flag raising at Iwo Jima. But I wanted to, you know, kind of bring back, um, you know, this very important part of the war. And China has been called the forgotten ally. And there's, there's a lot to be learned there. Um, so I, I appreciate you making the time, and I appreciate listeners making the time to uh, to um, you know hear about the book. And there's a lot of um, never before seen pictures that these families have been keeping for for years um, that we have up on our website, which is flyingtigersbook.com, and the book is available wherever books are sold, including on Amazon. <laughs> I'll get to that at the end. I promise you. I'll repeat. Oh, all oh of sorry. That. Okay. No, 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 no. Sorry, you're here to hawk a book. Why not? I do the same thing. You're listening to the Halle Kesser Jane Show. My guest today is the author of The Flying Tigers, the untold story of the American pilots who waged a secret war against Japan, Sam Kleiner. The Halle Kesser Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at HalleKesserJane.com and is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Be sure to find me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find The Halle Kesser Jane Show on your Alexa device, too. Let's go back to the cast of characters, because this I didn't know. Um, how many people uh, of, of ilk came out of all of this? Uh, one, Gregory uh, Pappy Boyington. Um, talk about him. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, how many people began as flying tigers? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of fascinating characters, um, like Pappy Boyington, who emerge out of this story. Um, so you get a wide array of different, um, of different characters who come out of this Um so tell, um, tell people who he was uh, in case they don't know who Pappy yeah, was. So yeah, so Boynton was a very famous um, Boynton was a very famous um, pilot who became one of the key um, pilots in World War II um, uh, and was shot down and held captive behind enemy lines. There's a TV show, Bob Up Black Sheep, that was ma- that was made about him. Um, so it's you know he kind of comes out of this rough and tumble experience as well. So there's a lot of um, you know, different characters in this story who become famous in their own right later on, including Claire Chenault. Um, so, you, you know, you kind of get a, a lot of cameos of very interesting, famous people in, in the midst of this book. Yeah, I, I, want, I want to throw some of them out just to tickle people to uh, to want to really pick the book up and read it in case they think that they know the story. They really don't. James Howard was, uh, was an, another one. Want to talk about him for a minute? Well, um, so uh, yeah, one of one of the people that I really like in the book is um, Joe Alslop, who's a um, a reporter who um, is yeah. a um, who um, was quite famous at the time, and then joined the Flying Tigers, and then had a um, really harrowing experience where he was actually taken prisoner by the Japanese in Singapore, where he was on a, a kind of a supply mission across the Far East, and then had to um, eventually get traded back for um, uh, Japanese diplomats who'd been taken prisoner in Washington. So you see all different kinds of, of fascinating people who are popping up in the course of the book. Uh, uh, Charles Older, he earned a law degree post-war, became the California support, uh, Superior Court judge and presided on the uh, murder trial of Charles Manson. It really, For the Manson, yeah. Yeah, right? I, that killed yeah, me. So kinda, like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of guys who went on to do different things over the course of their life, um, and the most remarkable part of it was that they... Um, you know, they all kind of stayed um, very tied to this idea of being a flying tiger, and so they would have these reunions every year um, where they would, um, you know, get together and uh, um, talk about the ex- their experiences in the war. And so I was; those were the same set of reunions that I was basically able to go to over the past couple of years um, and have the ability to kind of connect with some of the last remaining flying tigers. Um, and that, that's been, you know, a really, you know, it's something that, um, no matter what they ended up doing later in life, and a lot of these guys made a lot of money in kind of early cargo airlines. Um, they stayed very close to this community. But here, here's a couple of things, a, a different track I want to go on down with. It. We see them as heroes and they, bigger than life, and, and certainly they were innovators and, and all that kind of thing. But how did they fare afterwards, all of them? as Because uh, they saw some stuff that just was pretty bad uh the amazing amount of kills too by the way for uh, for for their time uh post-traumatic stress disorder uh was any of that revealed to you 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think that that was really something that people talked about in that in that generation. But I've spoken to a lot of the families, and they they'll talk more openly about that. There's a woman who I met whose father was part of the unit, and, and he was actually one of the few tigers who was taken prisoner and spent a few years in a Japanese POW camp. And she'll talk openly about you know the the fact that her father had PTSD. But that wasn't really a generation where we, you know, had developed that vocabulary yet, and there wasn't a lot of. Um, feeling around that. So it's, it's definitely something that came up um, uh, more uh, later were, on. Yeah, they were a different breed of cat. They didn't even talk about stuff like that. Uh, they may have experienced it, and, and that was something that probably kept uh, close to the vest. Uh, that we, You talked about the artwork. Who came up with that artwork? Did I ask you that? Uh, no, it's, it's actually, um, there was a cartoonist in the unit who, um, who came up with it. Um, and he, um, he, he was actually a fairly famous AP cartoonist before the war. And he came up with this art um, and, and um, played an important role in, in kind of the evolution of the unit. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, um, um, a, a great part of the story to see kind of how their, how their artwork developed. And then they originally saw the, um, uh, the the image of a plane with a kind of shark face in a magazine, and then they decided to try and mimic it, and it worked out really well and made them quite famous. <laughs> to say the least. Oh, my gosh. So you brought up uh, uh, the uh, former crew chief, uh, I guess when you're 98 years old, Frank Lazonsky? Uh Yes. Um, so I was... Yeah, so he's he's become a very close friend over the course of writing this, and I've gotten to spend a lot of time with him and his family. Um, so you know, it's definitely a, a great part of the story um, to be able to um, uh, ha- have that um, uh, kind of personal connection to the unit. How does he feel about being the last survivor? He's quite proud of it. He um, <laughs> he's he's a very funny guy, so he you know he enjoys it. Um, but you know it's it's you know he he's aware of this historical significance of the unit and um, uh, his his you know he has a keen sense of history. So he's been back. A lot of these guys went back to China for many years, and he he um, has a great affection for the Chinese people and um, and and he, he feels very strongly about it. What did um, he do and, with and the, thinks that they did important work? Right. What did he do with the rest of his life? Um, he had a long career in, in aviation, working both as a commercial pilot and in more kind of administrative roles. So he um, he um, took on a lot of different jobs over the course of his life. And most of these guys ended up working in the aviation industry in some way over the course of their lives. Um, but he was very proud of being a flying tiger, and it's something that you know he shared that legacy with his children and his grandchildren are very involved in the Flying Tigers Association. So there's definitely a strong familial tie that kind of keeps this bound together. So what was the story with uh, Jake Tapper and Memorial Day? Um, <laughs> so Jake uh, liked the book a lot, um, and I guess you know we've been really happy to see that people like the book um, and wanted to do a segment a bit with me and the last surviving tiger. So we went down and um, uh, filmed the segment of me giving him the book, which was really meaningful to me and you know for for Frank to have the opportunity to kind of um, get the acknowledgement that he so richly deserves that all of our veterans um, deserve. Um, and you know it's it's wonderful to be able to have that um, you know to be there for that small moment in history. So, so talk to me about this um, following a- after after the war. Uh, what happened to the Flying Tigers, uh, the unit? I mean, as a as a part of the uh, what what happened? They became what in the American? Well, uh, they were they were. <laughs> yeah, yeah they were they, they were only around for a very short period because they were they were really only there from. Uh, um, from uh, 1941 to middle of 1942, and then they went on to do different things throughout the rest of the course of the war. Um, so it, you know, it, it had it kind of naturally evolved um, where they would go on to do other things over the course of the war. A lot of them stayed in China and kept fighting, including Chenault, who was there up till 45, and then he actually returned back to. Um, uh, Louisiana briefly after the war and then moved back to China and spent the rest of his career essentially working for the Changs. Um, so they, they saw a lot of history and a lot of them went on to do different fascinating things. Some of them went on to um, serve in the OSS or serve as pilots in Europe. And I read about one pilot who went on to win the Medal of Honor um, for fighting over Germany. So you see all different kinds of things that happen to them. Um, and some of them were POWs who had incredible stories in their own right. So the book is really trying to weave all of that together into one uh, coherent narrative. So when you put something like this together and you get that involved, how long did it take you to put all, from, from the time you found the letters until the book came out was how long? About three years. About three years. So, so how it's you been doing? a long journey right, and it's been... Right. Yeah, and then, and then, it's, and then yeah, it's been the, the, the trip... 
Yeah, it's it's been it's been a real pleasure to to get the book out and to be able to um, to sell it and to uh, you know get the the story out there. And I think it's you know just a privilege to be able to share the story and to um, get it out to to readers across the country. But what happens to the writer? Because there's the historian part of you, but there's the writer part of you too, who gets so involved in this. Yeah, I'm always looking. I'm always looking for new stories. So the best part of it is, you know, getting feedback from people and, and hearing um, from listeners, and hopefully, you know, connecting with um, with with people about um, you know other ideas they have. Um, uh, um, um, the, you know, trying to get ideas for other things you might want to write. Right, but I'm. I'm. How are you emotionally having? been on such a high with all of this and going, 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 and now it's one oh, it's, down. You know, it's, uh, that's a great question. That you're the first person to ask that. Um, it's, you know, you have a normal life to, to lead, and, you know, you kind of, uh, sometimes it's fun to pop into a different Barnes & Noble and find some books. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to have a certain amount of love for the topic, but enough separation that you're kind of able to just lead your ordinary life to and not, you know, obsess over how many books you sold in a given week or something, <laughs> because it's, you know, it's ultimately not about the sales or, you know, it's, it's about, you know, what you're, it's selling very well and I'm very happy with it, but, you know, it's, it's about, um, uh, about the, you know, just the general feeling around the book. But you've also lived with these people for a long, long time. I mean, Sam, is that hard to let go of? You know, you have to just kind of, you have to kind of move on. Um, and you, I mean, it's, I, I have a great respect for the story, but, you know, it's part of the job of being a writer is finishing something. And, you know, it's, you know, it's, I felt like it's a really strong, important story. And then you have to kind of, you know, um, write it and carry it out to the public. And then your job as a writer is to find another story. So I, I also have a day job. I'm, a, I'm an attorney in New York as well. Right. So yeah. um, that is a, a very demanding <laughs> job. And that's, that's what my real focus right now as well. What kind of law? I'm a litigator. Oh. Um, so I practice at, oh, a, at a law firm, okay. um, and we, yeah, it's it's great. It's yeah. great fun. Um, so that's that's the um, that's the other part of my life. But you know, it's very similar. At the end of the day, it's about telling stories. You know, if you're if you're writing a brief for a judge, it's a different kind of audience. But you know, a lot of stuff is just about you know how are you going to tell your client's story, and that's not so different than how are you going to tell the story of a unit. Um, so it's it's a you know it's just a wonderful job you know right. to be able to. Um, Think of yourself as a writer and storyteller in these different contexts. So bef- when you started writing the book, you may have had a different perspective than the perspective you have now that it's over. And that's on the legacy of these guys. Is it different having explored their lives so intimately uh, as to what the Flying Tigers means to us historically and, I, and, and, and in other ways? Or what you went in thinking, was it the same when you left? I think I gained a greater appreciation for the importance of the human story and, and as a historian. And I think I went into it from more of a macro perspective and emerged with just a great love for these individual stories. And that's the kind of writing I'm, I'm passionate about continuing to do in some way over the, over the next few years. So, Sam, we know how they changed combat, war, the Air Force, the concept of flying uh, uh, in terms of, of um, combat. How did they change you? Did they? It's a great question. You might have to get back to me in a year. Uh, you know, it's still, the book is just out. Um, and so, but yeah, it definitely has made me have a much keener appreciation as a person about, you know, our country's history and just in general, think about that. Um, so I, I, you know, thank you for uh, making the time to help me share the story. And, um, you know, it's, it's made, definitely left a lasting impact on me. And I, I hope that it leaves one on readers as well. So everyone's welcome to um, check out the book on, on Amazon or, um, you know, we're getting great reviews and it's, it's available wherever books are sold. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. I've been speaking with historian and lawyer Sam Kleiner, the author of The Flying Tigers, the untold story of the American pilots who waged a war against Japan. For more information about The Flying Tigers and Sam Kleiner's book, visit flyingtigersbook.com. The Flying Tigers is available at fine bookstores everywhere and on Amazon.com. Now, a few words from me. A long time ago, and it was a long time ago, I got to meet one of my heroes. His name was Walter Wally Sherrar, and he was an astronaut. He flew three missions, Apollo 7, Gemini 6A, and Mercury Atlas 8. A Jersey boy, as I was a Jersey girl, he came to visit my next-door neighbors, an older couple, childless, who were like grandparents to me. 
they knowing my obsession with the space program, invited me to come and meet my hero. Funny the things you remember looking back. I was but a child, but I worried about what to wear. What would I say when we were introduced? What would he think of me, this brilliant, audacious American adventurer who would take America to new heights, both literally and figuratively? I'd been fascinated with NASA and the space program, beginning with that extraordinary day when we school kids were lined up and marched into the auditorium at Roosevelt Elementary School in Englewood, New Jersey, to watch Freedom 7, the first piloted Mercury spacecraft carrying astronaut Alan B. Shepard, Jr., launch from Cape Canaveral to an altitude of 115 nautical miles and a range of 302 miles. I was utterly fascinated by what I saw. I tingled from head to toe. That night I went home and wrote my first fan letter ever to my hero, Alan Shepard. By the way, I still have the signed letter NASA sent back. Years later, we would call the astronauts the right stuff. Back then, they were simply heroes. But I can tell you personally, they did have the right stuff. At least Sherrod did. When this little curly, toe-headed, pipsqueak of a girl walked herself over to Mr. and Mrs. Becker's home and knocked on that front door to meet her hero, she was met with a broad, dimple-laden smile, a large hand, and a man who seemed oh so larger than life, even larger than Superman. I remember him as a kind man who asked me all sorts of questions about my fascination with space travel, who treated me not as a nuisance, which I was, but with the utmost respect. He offered words of encouragement that little boys and certainly little girls could be anything they wanted to be. They just had to be the best they could be and must never, ever give up on their dreams. Looking back, Wally Sherrard and Alan Shepard and the John Glenns of their generation were cut from the same cloth as Claire Chenault and the other flying tigers of an earlier generation. Not too long ago, I spoke with astronaut Scott Paracinski. He, too, did not disappoint. But heroes today are few and far between. Oh, they're out there, but what we cherish in our society today, those we elevate to the standard of hero or heroine, they are not cut from the same cloth as those from earlier times, when the daring dared to do what people told them they couldn't do, when character was essential to success, and character compelled and impelled, and the upholding of one's character was more important than the result. I was raised in a time when truth, justice, and the American way was sacrosanct to all that America stood for. Courage, confidence, character, on my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law, was the pledge every little girl gave when she joined scouting. Scouting, yes, the Girl Scouts live today, but scouting and all that the word scouting conjures in one's adventure-filled imagination seems lost to playstations, mobile phones, the Kardashians, and the President of the United States, Donald Trump, who I'll return to in a minute. I want to return to astronauts. All these years later, we remember with pride the words of our astronaut heroes, such as the words of Neil Armstrong, who said as he took his first step and man's first step on the moon, that's one step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Speaking of giant leaps, for every leap forward, there are too many back. Presidents used to be heroes too. JFK, Ike, George Washington, George W. Bush. Let's fast forward to today. What will we remember of Donald Trump? I give you this quote. John McCain is not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. Alan Shepard, John Glenn, Wally Sherrar, and Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts, are all rolling in their graves. One giant leap backward. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to Talkish with Hallie Caster Jane, the Hallie Caster Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. Be sure to tune in to Talkish Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, when new podcasts are posted at HallieCasterJane.com and on all your favorite apps. We are open 24 7. So, until next time, when we meet again, this is Hallie Caster Jane. <laughs> <laughs>